Mission Hope Inspirational stories of faith and triumph Life's many upheavals, sharp curves, twists and turns, the challenging circumstances coming right at you, are non-stop. The inner wars within are outside your control and feel overwhelming. You feel alone, and the seemingly endless battles rage on. You feel like you have lost all hope and faith, questioning, why me? Why now? How can I handle another blow? The answers you're seeking are in this collection of 20 uplifting stories in this book. Within its golden pages, from the deep confines of their hearts and souls, these extraordinary authors have opened up and are here to assist you in navigating the deep, daunting, and dark waters that you are facing. Each story is unique in its experience, but similar in the fact that through everything presented to them in life, these authors have found the way back to success, peace, and joy through hope and faith. These authors have turned tragedy into tranquility once again. Now, they are here to empower you, to shift from what once was fear and failure into the future of your dreams. They offer as a gift to you the freedom to choose your destiny. Now, it's time to turn the key and walk through the door. Hear from the authors themselves, as they share their journey and story with you, here, on Living the Next Chapter. Okay, everyone, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. I have another amazing author joining us today with a very interesting last name, which we're going to get into, um, a part of Shar Murphy's next book, the next book in the series, offering you hope and now faith. Uh, we love a, a, some Shar Murphy. Uh, Elizabeth is here with me today on the podcast to talk about her chapter in the next book that's coming out. Excited to have Elizabeth on the show. Elizabeth, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. Thank you so much, Dave. I'm really happy to be here with you. Okay, so we just talked before we hit record about your amazing last name and the story behind the last name and what it means. Can you please fill in the blanks for us here on, on, on the podcast? Absolutely. Well, I, I hope my response about my last name doesn't get too long, but the, the name Urabe uh, I acquired when I was in my mid-20s. I was living in Japan, and I, I married a Japanese man, and uh, Japanese uh, names have Chinese characters in them, and the two characters that make up Urabe are actually very unusual. They're not the typical characters, and so a lot of Japanese people had, had trouble um, pronouncing it. But the two characters translate out to, to family of divine origin. And I absolutely love that, that name from the beginning. And so even though uh, after, after 14 years of marriage, I ended up leaving Japan, I really knew that, that there was no way I was ever going to let go of the name Urabe. And I can actually tie into one other thing that's important is that when I was, uh, my maiden initials were ERR. And I felt like a mistake. That was kind of my original wound. My married initials of ERU, which is how I sign all of my, my artwork and my poetry and my writing, is a Japanese verb meaning to receive. So you kind of got the Reader's Digest version there about why the, the name and now the brand Urabe are so significant to me. So, okay, that's amazing. Um, do you still have access to your Japanese language at all? You know, I've been back in the States since 1999, uh, and I haven't, I haven't had the opportunity to use it other than the fact that, that I have a half-Japanese daughter who moved here, and so <laughs> we'll occasionally use words in Japanese when we're trying to, to have everybody who's listening not understand what we're talking about. <laughs> so, you know, after 24 years, uh, it, it would be rusty, but I have a, natu a natural uh, aptitude for language. And so I have no doubt that that when, I won't say if, but when the opportunity to return to Japan arises, that it'll come back quickly. I always felt like I was learning. I always felt like I was remembering a language that I'd known from another lifetime, not really learning a new one. So kind of yes and no to your question. <laughs> okay, so I have a selfish reason for asking because I have listeners in Japan that are listening to our episode right now. And it That's would be so exciting. amazing if you were able to greet them or say hello or something to hello. welcome them to the podcast. Which, can you do something like that? Okay, so right there. Wow, can you translate for us as well? 
I just, Yoroshiku no Naishimasu is a very Japanese phrase. Uh, it, it's like, it's the, it would be the equivalent of saying, I'm honored to be with you, Dave, on this, this podcast. It's a, it's a, a, a phrase of, of showing respect to people. And then the, the Urabe Erizabesu, that's the, the Erizabesu probably sounds like Elizabeth. Um, and the Urabe is, they, they switch the order of the name. So, so you put the surname first and then the, and then the first name. See. <laughs> Things like that come easily, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so before we jump off of that, and what is about Japanese culture that was interesting to you from where you grew up and now you're in a different part of the world? What kind of things did you learn about Japanese culture that really stuck with you? Oh, my goodness. Well, it, it's interesting because I, I didn't, um, you know, I never wanted to be anything when I grew up. I didn't have aspirations of learning Japan, Japanese and moving to Japan. But my path has unfolded very organically. And uh, I had ended up studying Japanese in college just because it was such a different language from the French and Spanish that I'd already learned. And when I was getting ready to graduate, it was very easy to get a job speaking English. So I just got on a plane and moved to Tokyo without even knowing where I was going to live. Um, and I ended up, you know, again, following along the theme of, of destiny. Uh, within two years, I had met the man who I, I married, somehow knowing deep down that it wasn't a uh, till death do us part marriage, but it was definitely an important uh, growing step for both of us. And he was he was Japanese. His parents were Japanese, and they welcomed me into their family. And I what what I actually look back on the years now and realize that I didn't fully appreciate it while I was there because they were such formative years for me. But the Japanese have such incredible discipline and respect for nature and respect for each other. And I, I've always said that if they had a very clear spiritual vision, that they would be global leaders. That's the one thing I've always felt that the Japanese were lacking because they're such a, an island nation. You know, they're so uniform. But if they had a, a, a genuinely global vision, uh, they could be spiritual leaders. So I came back from Japan with a profound sense of um, just a, a deep ability to really appreciate nature, um, ability to, to focus on the details of things, the smaller part of the picture and not just the whole things like the tea ceremony and, and, uh, uh, yeah, Ikebana flower arranging. They have a real appreciation for the part, and I, I'm actually I'm actually having my my spirit guides tell me to give you one more beautiful example um, from mm. Japan. The first summer that I was there, I was on a very very crowded shinkansen, a, a bullet train, uh, on my way up up north, and it was hot, and and I was cheek to cheek, literally and physically, with everybody else on the train. In this country that would be cause for a, a woman to be in a state of panic, having people pressed all around her. Well, the man who was standing next to me shifted his, his weight a little bit and started to reach into his pocket. And he pulled out a clean handkerchief and handed it to me because he could see that my brow was sweating from being cheek to cheek with so many people. And he realized that I didn't, I hadn't quite learned that when you got on a crowded train in Japan, you carried a handkerchief so that you could wipe the sweat off your forehead. That was one of the most beautiful early examples I had of just how a foreign, uh, as a foreigner, even the Japanese men would, would see me and treat me with respect as a human being that so often in this country just isn't there, to put it mildly. Wow. Yeah, yeah you, you definitely nailed that one. My gosh. Um, well, see, that's captivating for me because... I think that gives us context um, to your story, but also context to maybe how us, where we live, maybe how we can treat people better just by listening to that story. That's amazing. Absolutely. I never forgot that. And even now telling you that it was probably, let's say, well, it would have been the summer and it was 40 years ago that I moved to Japan. I can actually still picture and feel myself in that situation, nervous because I had grown up in America where things are not nearly so safe. And this man just pulled out a perfectly pressed, clean handkerchief and handed it to me. And it, it just took my breath away. Yeah. Mm. I love the humanity. That's beautiful. Um, let's talk about this wonderful person that we have in common. Uh, she goes by the name Char Murphy. Um, can you tell me how you crossed paths with Char Murphy and how you got roped into this amazing new book that's coming out? <laughs> roped into. Char and I first crossed each other's radar as part of the Biz Catalyst 30, uh, 360 community uh, orchestrated by Dennis Pitoko. We'd been, um, we'd been both writing and we had a lot of connections in common. And 
when I launched my uh, my Urabe website uh, a little over a year ago, Shar was very, very interested in the products. And so we've had communication back and forth. And earlier this year in January, um, right after Mission Hope had launched, two of the people, or, excuse me, right before Mission Hope launched, two of the, the authors reached out to me asking me to write recommendations for their chapters in the book. And I thought that was interesting because out of 18 authors and all of the thousands of you know, common connections that we had on LinkedIn, two of them wanted my, my input on what they'd written. So as a result of that, Shar and I had back and forth communication. Uh, there was just a mix up about the, the recommendation process. And in the course of that, she, she told me that she'd um, thought about asking me to be a part of Mission Hope, but, but the slots got filled up quickly. And when she shared with me the, the names of the other uh, books, you know, Mission Hope, and then there was going to be Faith and Love and Grace and all of the other titles, I said to her, well, let me know when you're going to, to do the Facebook, because that would definitely be up my alley. And apparently, the, the order that she'd received them in as a divine communication to publish these books, Faith was not slated to be second on the list, but she changed the order on, on her own I call them orders from headquarters. It's like, you know, divine yeah. nudges. Whatever you <laughs> she got an order from headquarters to change the order on the books and let me know that faith was going to be second. And the moment I found out that, that she was going to be doing the Facebook next in order, literally my chapter started downloading in my head. I mean, the, the mo I didn't know anything about the process. I didn't know what was going to be required from me. I just started to watch. Them. <laughs> so there was no question in my mind that I was supposed to be a part of that book. And I, I actually wrote my chapter three months before she even started vetting, vetting people for the second book. And when I shared it with her, there was just a moment between us where it, it came through me. So I don't say this egotistically. I say it with, with complete respect for the power of the divine that comes through me. But it came through me so perfectly that it brought both Char and me to our knees. And that just bonded our hearts in a way like two magnets that get closer and closer and then they jump and from that moment on, you're, you're absolute, we call each other soul and spirit sister. And there's a, an unspoken communication and love and respect there that has never faltered for a heartbeat since that time. So I love it. So one thing I'm going to be asking all of the authors and I've been doing this so far for mission hope. And now this one is, I love getting you on the podcast to talk about your chapter, but I would love for you, if I got out of the way for a second, could you talk to Shar directly and give her a message from you to Shar, I'm not in the room. We're all just in the audience listening, but you get a chance for you to talk to Shar directly and whatever you'd like to say to Shar. This is a gift to her for including us in the process. What would you say to Shar as she's listening to the episode? Oh, Shar as a being is, I've actually been thinking about this since you and I spoke last week because Shar is just such a, a, a pure and precious being. Shar is like, if you've been drowning, and, and you're running out of the ability to tread water. Shar is like that that breath of fresh air. Shar is Shar is a, a piece of bread and a glass of water when you're when you're starving and, and dying of thirst. Shar is the kind of unconditionally loving presence who will go the extra ten yards every single time and be there and give her heart and give her her, her mind and give her spirit. And Shar gives Shar gives a hundred and fifty percent every time. And God bless her for her. Her, her sacrifice is the constant. I'm, t I'm speaking to you, Shar. I'm sending you hugs. She, she knows how much I love her. Absolutely one of, one of the greatest gifts of God to this planet at this time in the evolution of consciousness is this, this beautiful being, Shar Murphy, who I'm honored to call my soul and spirit sister. I love there you. you. Go. There you go, Shar. We all do, Shar. So I know last time we did this for the book one, we included that, those messages. And the feedback I got from Shar was she was just in tears <laughs> as she heard yeah, people's she thoughts and yeah. <laughs> right. But we don't get a chance to do this often enough to recognize people in our lives that have an impact on us and give us an opportunity to share our story. And I think that's a lesson that we all need to kind of consider is how can we give space to people and honor people? Um, because there's a, People, we, we go through loss in life and people gather around a room when someone has left us and that's when all the best comments come out. And unfortunately, the person's not there to hear them. And I think that we need to do more to celebrate each other 
and do that as often as possible. So thank you for sharing about Shar. I love that. Thank you for asking. And I totally agree, Dave. You're absolutely right. Awesome. Okay, so the book is around faith. When you hear the word faith, what about that word clings to you? What does that word mean to you in relation to your chapter? I love that you asked that question because when I started downloading my chapter, the, the in the first paragraph, I actually write that the, the first thing that I did was self-inquire. I asked myself, what does faith mean to me? Because it's so, you know, especially these days with the whole new age era and spirituality being commercialized and words get tossed around very lightly and, and people whatever's spiritually hip, whatever's the word of the month, like the Baskin and Robbins flavor of the month, people use words almost because they're trying to get attention or because they think they'll be accepted, but not because they're words that have tremendous power and meaning to them as individuals. And the word faith to me is, is a very, very, very powerful word because it, it comes, it, it goes to the realm of the absolute. It's, it's unconditional. To me, faith has to be unconditional or it's not, it's not faith. And what that means is that that every step of my life, uh, faith and grace are very intertwined. Faith has been there guiding me to do things that my rational mind would never have agreed to. I never would have understood, but I knew somehow that I had to do it. And I trusted the process enough to let down all my inhibitions and, and just jump. I mean, I've, I've left before left before I looked more times than I can count. Uh, and faith is the in, invisible thread of grace the light of grace that's been guiding me every step of the way and which I lean on. I like, I like the way that you phrase that too, because it, it's not in the mind. We can't control faith. Uh, we have to be willing to surrender to it and, and trust the bigger picture, even if we don't like the details of what may or may not be happening in form. So I hope that was a, 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 a <laughs> I hope that wasn't too garbled. That, that's no, the way it that came was, out of me right now. <laughs> that was good. And I think, Everyone actually exercises faith every day. We get in our car, we put our seatbelt on, we jump on a plane like it's nothing. Um, we exercise faith without even saying the word. It's just something that we do. But the moment we say the word, there seems to be a religious connotation to it that you're talking about this type of faith. But faith is far reaching and it impacts us in many different ways. And, and all around the world, it also demonstrates in different ways. So, I kind of want to make sure that pe people understand that faith is a, is a large thought, and a, a large practice that we're all doing, but we need to make be more conscious of how we live a life of faith and how our life of faith affects others. What do you think about that? Absolutely. And you just the key word you just said is conscious. You're absolutely right. When we get in the car to drive, when we get on a plane to fly somewhere, we don't think about the fact that our lives could end in a heartbeat. So that's an act of faith. But the key difference is con conscious faith is the ability to meet the circumstances of our lives that that we might not that might not be comfortable or to whatever much more horrific degree when things seem out of control. I don't I'm not a religious person uh, at all. I have no no problem with people who are religious. Uh, but unfortunately, religion has led to more <laughs> religion is supposed to be about love. And in this this world, unfortunately, that's not the case. But I am. I'm absolutely talking about faith as being the the unconditional, all encompassing umbrella that ties all of us together. Uh, the metaphor that just came to me is it's an infinite ocean, and we're each waves in it, and we each have our perfect part that we need to play in order for that that ocean to be whole. So for me, faith is knowing that my part in that whole is always being protected by the whole, even as I make the decisions that I have to make as an individual within the the bigger picture. I don't know if that confused or made it more no, clear, but no, yeah. no, I am. I feel like I'm on a journey with you. This is great. Um, I want to stay with the tour because there's so much to learn. Uh, from your okay. chapter then, tell, take us behind the scenes of your chapter, this download that you're talking about. What what are you interested and curious for the readers to find out about when they read your chapter? What brings you joy when you think about the chapter you wrote in Char's book? <laughs> Excellent question. Okay, the, the, so as I was writing this chapter, um, one sentence came, well, a couple of sentences came through that, that kind of knocked me off my feet. One was that, for me, faith and surrender have always been very, very closely entwined. And this entire chapter is actually about how my, my all-encompassing faith 
has allowed me to act in, in, in small and increasingly bigger surrenders throughout my whole life to that. So as an individual wave, I would continually surrender to the command of the ocean, even and especially when my mind and my conditioning were screaming bloody murder that that wasn't the right thing to be doing. So the, the, I think the most important message running through my entire chapter is that, that I won't say idea, the fact that we, we, we will come to a point in our lives where, where we're asked to do something so, so big, so beyond our comprehension that, that we can't even believe that we're going to be doing it. And yet everything in us knows that that's exactly what we're being asked to do. And I think everybody at, at this point in their, in their lives, especially is aware that, that the, the world situation is precarious. Our lives are precarious. You know, people who are healthy one day are gone the next. Nothing is, tomorrow is not guaranteed to anybody, no matter how healthy we think we are or aren't. So we really need to be all in and, and step up and say, what did I come to do? Why am I here at this point in the evolution of consciousness? Am I giving 100% or am I only giving 99.9% and hoping nobody's noticing that I'm not all in? We're all being called to go to the edge of the cliff, to jump, and to know that we can fly. And that's, there's, there's one, one section, as, it, as my chapter builds, there's one point in it where I talk about what I call the great surrender. And it's exactly what I was just referencing, that I, I reached a point in my life where I couldn't even believe what I knew I was going to do. And yet I knew I was going to do it and I did it. <laughs> so now mm. that was probably pretty tantalizing. I don't know if you've read mm -hmm. my chapter, but you. <laughs> I haven't read it yet. I am going to though. And I, that's what I love is <laughs> the idea behind having all the authors come on and talk about their chapters is when somebody gets this book, I want to give them a really well-rounded um, opportunity to not only just read the words, but hear the voice hear the story behind the chapter and connect with you as an author and a reader and build that bridge by putting it all together in one big group, one package. So I love being able to hear your story. It's amazing. Beautiful. So, and of course, okay. the uh, I was just going to say the, the voice, you know, to, it, it adds a whole different dimension to hear the person speaking about their, their experience and their chapter rather than just reading it on the page. It makes it more, more multidimensional. So. Mm. I love that. Um, so you talked about poetry. Uh, let's talk about that for a second. You you write poetry as well. Like talk about that that side of you as well. <laughs> it's so funny because I have no. I majored in French studies. The only reason I, I chose my major was because I was good at language, and I didn't particularly want to go to college. I just needed to go as a uh, in in between getting out of high school and moving on with my life. Uh, I've, I've never done anything, um, any of the major events of my life have never been because I thought it was important. They've just been things that were the right thing to do. And I, I realized afterward why I did them. So, you know, I, I mentioned being an artist, uh, but I never had any interest in art. In 1995, I started channeling these pictures and I knew something huge was happening. And in the first four years, I did 350 of them. Well, the poetry happened the same way about seven or eight years ago, I was sitting on my front porch one morning having breakfast. And usually I was in such a hurry, you know, I would eat and, and I had to jump up and do the dishes and the, the mental list of things that we have to do that are so important. Well, for some reason, this particular morning, I just sat and I looked out at my front yard and I noticed on the juniper tree right in front of my porch, there was a tiny bird at the top of it and he was preening his feathers. It's like that nothing in the world mattered more than preening his feathers. And a, a haiku type poem came to me and it said, today I sat still and touched eternity while a tiny bird preened. And that was the beginning of two years of nonstop channeling <laughs> poetry <laughs> for the first, for the first year or so, they were all what I called haiku, the short three verses. And then they graduated to what I, I affectionately called Siamese haiku, and they'd be sets of two verses. And then they got more complex, and they're sets of four, and I call those quadruplets. And they continued for about two years, and I've got well over 200. And then they just they stopped, and in the last few years, I've done uh, actually done some incredibly powerful rhyming poems, which which really blew my mind, because I didn't think a poem could, could rhyme well and be powerful. 
and whoever's writing flew me with me sure proved me wrong because they, they caught, I go back and read them and, and I'll tell you, I'll give you a perfect example of how it, I can tell you it's not me as an individual writing these, the, these poems. There will be poems where I get guided to use a word and I wouldn't even be able to define that word if you, if you ask me to. One, of the, one example is the word ubiquitous. I use the word ubiquitous perfectly in a poem. And even right now, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly <laughs> what it means. But I went back and looked it up and said, oh, my God, I used that word perfectly. That, that's one of my favorite examples. So the poetry, whatever I do creatively like that, what, whether it's the art, the two-dimensional art or the poetry or even the writing that I do, it's it's more of a birthing process. I, I feel something ready to be born. I get death out of the way so that it can come through as purely as possible. And then I give birth and then I step back and look at it and, and admire it almost like a third person. Um, that, that that actually just reminded me in the first years that I was, was drawing my art, uh, I was I was nonstop seven or eight hours a day seven days a week. It was absolutely exhausting. And there was one day where I'd, I'd completed a design and I was, I was exhausted. I stepped back, I looked at it, I admired it. I was ready to take a nap. And I literally, Dave, I literally felt the, the voices of all of the other pictures waiting to be born through me, arguing about which was going to be the next one to be born. <laughs> <laughs> I was not allowed to rest. I literally had to go back to the drawing board and keep drawing because they were all ready to be born through me. So it was, it was quite a process. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole argument going on behind the scenes. I love that. It was. They were, it's like they were pushing each other out of the way, trying to be next in line to come through. <laughs> me, me first, me first. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, so on, on that topic then, Elizabeth, like for us listening, is there a way for us to find your art and to find your poetry? Oh, absolutely. Well, on the uh, the two websites that I know you'll have at, 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 um, on the credits at the end of the show, one of the, the websites is older art. It's galleries of older art from from the 90s when I when I first started drawing it. And there are also um, there's also a section with writings, which has a, a very interesting lengthy bio. And then um, I think all of the poetry is in there under exactly those headings that I just mentioned, the, the haiku, the Siamese haiku and the quadruplet. So on the uh, on my personal website uh, will be that gallery of art. And then the other website is one of the ways that the art has, has recently branched off as it starts to come into the world is a, a website of hundreds of, of different products with the with six of the d designs used. Um, and, and when I say diverse products, it's close to 800 on this website. So two completely different uh, aspects of the art uh, will be on those two websites. Okay, Elizabeth, um, is it possible, I'm asking as a friend now, for me to post that first poem on like our social media, for example, just so people can see it and we'll link back to your episode? Is that okay if we can share that? Absolutely. None of this is, you know, it's funny. I don't have any, any possessive, there's no possessiveness in me about any of this. I don't see it as being mine. I never hmm. once signed a piece of art. I'll initial the back and I'll put the date that it was completed. But nice. I don't sign it because I, I don't feel like it's mine to own. I feel like it, just like children are not our our possessions. I, I call these my spirit children, and and uh, they're they're there for anybody anybody whose whose intentions are to help bring love and and harmony and the things that our world so badly needs. Use any of it anytime, however your your heart is guided to use it. Amazing, because I felt like I was sitting at the kitchen table with you, seeing the bird in the tree. I have a cup of coffee. It's almost empty, and I need to go refill. And I'm sitting there with you, and I'm watching you write that. That's what I felt like when you were explaining that. I love it. And, you know, it, it's all about the energy. That's the thing. There, there really, it, there's no time. Time has completely dissolved. And as I was telling you that story, again, the word consciousness, I was fully conscious of that memory. I was living that memory, and that's why you feel it, because of the degree of consciousness that I put into the telling of the story. So it really doesn't matter. I could tell you a story from 40 years ago. I could tell you a story from this morning at breakfast. It really has no, there's no difference. It's the level of consciousness in the telling of those two stories that, that is the power that allows the reader or the listener or the viewer to have that powerful experience. It's what makes my art alive. I can't tell you how many people look at 
whether it's the products on the website or the pictures that I post of the, the prints, people literally feel the energy vibrating. And that's because it's, it's alive with divine energies that are getting ready to, to help lead this world to what Eckhart Tolle calls a new earth. I have, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I, uh, it was about 12 years ago and I wrote, uh, a foreword for a, uh, it wasn't a, a book that was a, a story in any way, but it was a book of art. And I made a statement in this book saying that, that Rabe spirit art is one of the most powerful reflections of source energies available to us at this point in the evolution of consciousness. I wrote that sentence. Actually, what I wrote was, I wrote it's the most powerful reflection. And then my ex-husband and his, his friends kind of read it and said, aren't you being arrogant to say it's, it's the most? So I changed it to one of the most powerful. But every word that I use has, has tremendous um, meaning. I'm not claiming that the art is the source. I'm not claiming that the art is God. I'm claiming that the art is a perfectly clear reflection of that source so that when an individual comes in contact with it, he can take it to the bank that what he or she experiences is a part of, of his or her own path. And that's really what healing involves, um, completing the pictures of our own individual puzzles, not trying to, to project it out onto the world or, or somebody we don't like or, or racial, racial inequality, religious inequality. The world is in the shape it's in because we're not fully owning our own experience. And healing, the, the word healing, heal actually means to make whole. So the, <laughs> Shar would be laughing at me now because I'm downloading this information. Um, <laughs> we need to complete the puzzle, the, the puzzles of our own individual existence before we can go forth in the world and truly be powerful as healers. And that involves all of the, the pieces inside us that are still subconscious. So when you come in contact with a perfectly clear mirror, Anything that you see or feel or think or experience, you know, is part of you. When you when you come in contact with a dirty mirror, you know, for example, if you're with a, a someone who's who's much lower consciousness, people get into arguments because they're they've gone unconscious, they've gone to sleep, and they're projecting what they don't like about themselves onto the other person, and that's what leads to arguments at the worst or world world wars at the excuse me arguments at the least or world wars at the worst. We need to fully own our own puzzle. And the best and easiest way for that to happen is to have a clear mirror so you can look in it and go, oh, yeah, that's me. Whether you like it or you don't like it doesn't matter. It's part of your puzzle, and your puzzle needs to be whole before you're fully empowered to do and be what you came to do and be. I feel mouthful. like I'm in school, Elizabeth. I feel like I'm in school. There's going to be a test after this, and I'm making notes like crazy. You can't see me right now, but I'm making notes like crazy. Wow. Wow. You are making my brain spin, and I love every second of it. Um, okay, so one thing I, I would love – we're going to close on the second here. The one thing I want to really kind of put towards you because of all the amazing stuff you've been showing us and sharing with us so far, right now – I live in Canada. You're in the U.S. I feel like as a as a culture, we're really disconnected and divided. And I really want to get to that wholeness that you're talking about. How do we get to more connection and more undivided um, as a culture? From your perspective, where are we going and how do we get there? It, it, everything... You know, it's such a cliche, but it's true. Everything starts from the inside out. The the simplest way is to remember three words that my my very first teacher, before I met my spiritual master, I was in my 20s and I met a psychologist who had a profound impact on me. And he taught me this whole idea that, that everything is a mirror. And he used three words. He said, projection makes perception. Projection mm. makes perception. So anything that we perceive, whether it's in your wife sitting across from you at the table or something you read in the news about what's going on in the Ukraine, everything that we perceive is the projection of something inside us. So it needs to be healed from the inside out before anything out there can change. And the reason it seems like things aren't changing very quickly is because we've got a whole bunch of people who are happy to own the good stuff. And they're not at all happy about owning the fact that, that 
I'm going to say something that, that Neil Donald Walsh wrote in um, Conversations with God in the 90s. Did you read that series? No, I haven't. But I'm interested. Yeah. Neil, Neil, Don, Neil Donald Walsh, is a, he's a wonderful, he wrote a, a series called Conversations with God back in the 90s, um, and they were completely channeled books that, the, the wonderful thing about them is the humor that he brought to some very powerful life teachings. Well, in, Neil, in, in one of his books, he wrote, Hitler went to heaven, and the, the, if, if you can understand that, then you, you're starting to have a, an inkling of the fact that we create monsters like Hitler out there because there's a whole population that's unwilling to really look at the fact that we're all at very deep levels capable of hatred or anti-Semitism or violence or racism or whatever it is that we, we try to pretend we're not. And we, we project it onto, well, humanity, the, the world projected onto this one individual, made him the bad guy in an effort for the, the world to, to get itself righted again. I don't, you know, who knows whether or not it will be successful. But at, at the end of the day, we can't see anything in the world that's not a part of us. And the ability to choose the beautiful things in life can only come when we've fully embraced the ugly things. Right now, people are, are they're on hamster wheels. They're, they're, they're reaching for what they think is good, and they're trying to run away from what they think is bad. But the middle path involves the conscious ability to choose health and beauty and love, not because you're afraid of the opposite, but because who wouldn't choose what's beautiful if they understood they had a choice. But you can't, you can't choose what's beautiful if you're still split and trying to keep half of, half of your puzzle out of the way because you're ashamed of it or you don't like it or it hurt. The, the picture has to be whole until you can choose, consciously choose to create a world of love. Did that answer you? I forgot what your question oh, was. No. <laughs> no. Um, I'm like rewinding this entire podcast because there are so much, there's so much great stuff here, Elizabeth. I don't, I, uh, you got me speechless. I don't even know what to say. I'm a podcaster and I don't even know what to say. <laughs> well, thank you for bringing that out in me because it, I, I don't, um, it, it, it's interesting. Shara, you know, when Shara said that this, this opportunity to speak with you had come up, I wasn't, I wasn't a hundred percent sure that I wanted to do it mainly because I hadn't had any, had any communication with you before. And it takes, it really takes a certain person to bring the best out in me. And if I'm going to put myself out there, I need a dance partner, so to speak, who's capable uh -huh. of bringing So, you know, it's, it's kudos to you that, that I saw and felt. And of course to Shar for, you know, if Shar told me, Hey, Dave's 24 karat gold, then I believed her. But in the conversation that we had last week, I could tell you know, that you were a perfect dance partner and that you would create the space, ask the questions and draw out of me what, what I needed to say, what you needed to hear and beyond you and me, what the world really needs to hear. I, I come along, this might actually be a good place to end. I don't know if you're ready to end it, mm -hmm. but when oh, I was yeah. a kid, I used, I used to come along, I, I, people, uh, I would come along in people's lives and their lives would fall apart like Hurricane Beth had come through. <laughs> and I never yeah. understood why. It had nothing to do with what I said or did. It was just like my energy was so unsettling that their lives would fall apart. And as a child, I always felt guilty about that. I didn't understand why. And then as my, my spiritual path deepened in my maturity, my, I, I became more and more spiritually mature. I understood that, that that was my gift. And I tend to come along in people's lives when when they've climbed almost to the summit of the mountain and they're tired and they just want to rest for a while and enjoy the view and pat themselves on the back and say, you know, good job, Dave, good job, Beth. I come along and I kick you off and I say, I don't care if you're 99.9% .9 of the way there. Honestly, it doesn't mean anything if you're not all in and a hundred percent. So <laughs> that was, yeah, that memory just came to me is that at, at my best, and thank you for bringing this out in me. I have, that's what I feel like I'm here to do is have the courage to come along and say 99.9 ain't good enough. You, you got to go all the way or it's not going to, it's not going to hold up under what's coming in the, the, the shift that, that the world is getting ready to experience. We need to be a hundred percent. We need to be all in and we need to know who's got our backs and who we can really trust to be in our corner when we need them there. So thank you for being one of those people for me. Well, Elizabeth, the dance card goes both ways. I'm the I'm the guy in the corner at eighth grade dance who is afraid to even 
step out on the floor and you just you just pulled me out on the floor and you made me dance so that's uh that's on you <laughs> well, I did my job and you did yours and that's you know I love the um when I when I think about relationships ballroom dance is always what comes to mind for me and I'm not speaking of rom- I'm just talking about any relationship you know you and I yeah. are in a dance relationship in this conversation and the ideal relationship is one where you can't tell who's leading or following it's seamless right. it's effortless one person takes a breath and the other one automatically moves with them I think those are the kind of relationships that we need to develop to develop with each other because the, the trust is already there. And so if, if you guide me the little slightest little bit to go in a certain direction, I don't need to ask why I trust that, that we need to be going in that direction. I have faith that that higher power that brought us together is make is guiding us to do that. And it just happens effortlessly. So this conversation, it sounds like for both of us has been the, the embodiment of that kind of uh, beautiful ballroom dance. And I love it. <laughs> Well, thank you for taking a chance to be part of this dance and being a part of the podcast. Thank you for penciling me in into your dance card. I know your dance card's pretty full, but you made room for us, and I really appreciate it. Um, Elizabeth, yeah. again, thank you so much for being part of Char's book. Thank you for being open to that and um, allowing us a little insight into you as an author, into your poetry, your art, and your story. I really, really appreciate you being on the podcast And again, our thoughts and our thanks to Char for making this relationship and dance even happen. So, Char, thank you for doing that. Amen. Love you, Char. (laughs) (laughs) All right, everyone. All the information we heard about today is in the show notes. We'd love for you to go check out all of Elizabeth's great poetry and artwork and share the episode with somebody that needs a great dance partner. Elizabeth is there ready to dance with you. And share her story with you, Elizabeth. Thanks again for being part of this. Thank you so much, Dave. It's been an absolute pleasure. Hey, just jumping on here at the end. Thank you so much for checking out this episode, Living the Next Chapter, talking about Mission Hope Volume 2. You definitely want to pick up a copy of this book. Head over to OurMissionHope.com Our, O-U-R, MissionHope.com All the information in the show notes. Get a copy of this book get one for yourself get one for your best friend and let's encourage these authors as they write and share their stories with us if you want to connect with me my name is dave living the next chapter.com living the next chapter.com i would love to have you reach out through the website let me know what you think of this episode what you think of the podcast and let's encourage our fellow authors And let's do something great. Thank you for being here on the podcast. Again, it's the second book from our great friend, Char Murphy, Mission Hope, Inspirational Stories of Faith and Triumph at OurMissionHope.com. Thanks for being here. Catch you on the next one.